Hi, my name is Gordon Palmer. I'm minister here at Claremont Parish Church and welcome along for our service for um, Sunday, the uh, 14th of March. Taking part in the service today, Stephen Preston will be bringing God's word to us. It's Alan Cuthbertson doing the Bible reading and Maureen Thompson leading us in our prayers for others. I want to begin the service by reading a few verses from Isaiah, verses that featured in the service last week. On this mountain, the Lord Almighty will prepare a feast of rich food for all peoples, a banquet of aged wine, the best of meats and the finest of wines. On this mountain, he will destroy the shroud that enfolds all peoples, the sheet that covers all nations. He will swallow up death forever. The sovereign Lord will wipe away the tears from all faces. He will remove his people's disgrace from all the earth. The Lord has spoken. In that day they will say, surely this is our God. We trusted in him and he saved us. This is the Lord, we trusted in him. Let us rejoice and be glad in his salvation. Let us worship the God who gives us that call to hope, that call of certainty and of a sure foundation. Christ has made the sure foundation is our opening hymn.
We're going to join together in prayer and we'll gather up our prayers in the words of the Lord's Prayer. The words for the form of the Lord's Prayer that we use will be on the screen. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you for that sure foundation that you are a God who hasn't left us to guess. You're not a God who has left us to make up our ideas about you. You've not left us to invent clever solutions to life's predicaments. Not left us to work out some huge and complicated formula to discern life's purpose. Rather, you've come to us in Jesus. You've come to us as one of us. You've come to us and made yourself known in the life, the death, and the rising of a Lord Jesus. And more, gracious God, you point forward through Christ to a time when he will come again, a time when all will be gathered up in the fullness of life and the glory of your eternal future. We thank you for that vision that Isaiah gives us of more to come and better that we're called to. And we thank you that Jesus reinforced that message that better's to come and there is more that we're being called to. Gracious God, we ask forgiveness for the times when we've made light of your provision for times when we have not been thrilled and excited by all that you call us to and all that you've offered to us. Times when we've taken your provision and your love for granted. Forgive us for these. And renew and reinvigorate a hope that in Christ there is more and the best that's still to come. And might that enthuse and encourage us as we seek to live for Jesus, in whose name we pray and in whose words we gather up our prayers. Our Father, Today's reading is from Luke chapter 11, verses 1 to 13, entitled, Jesus Teaching on Prayer. One day Jesus was praying in a certain place. When he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray, just as John taught his disciples. He said to them, When you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, for we also forgive everyone who sins against us. And lead us not into temptation. Then Jesus said to them, Suppose you have a friend, and you go to him at midnight and say, Friend, lend me three loaves of bread. A friend of mine on a journey has come to me, and I have no food to offer him. And suppose the one inside answers, Don't bother me. The door is already locked, and my children and I are in bed. I can't get up and give you anything. I tell you, even though he will not get up and give you the bread because of friendship, yet because of your shameless audacity, he will surely get up and give you as much as you need. So I say to you, Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks, receives. The one who seeks, finds. And to the one who knocks, the door will be opened. Which of you fathers, if your son asks for a fish, will give him a snake instead? Or if he asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion? If you then... Though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children. 
How much more will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? Amen. Well, good morning, everyone, and uh, Happy New Year to you all. In a fortnight's time, of course, the clocks change, and as we charge into summer, autumn, and next winter. But today is the first anniversary of the last time we met in Claremont, in person, in this building for morning worship. And a lot has changed in that year. Many folks have lost loved ones, sometimes directly, from COVID, arguably, in some cases, indirectly from COVID. People have lost jobs and livelihoods and businesses have folded. There's been a lot of loss. Nobody, Christian or otherwise, has been unaffected by the changes and by the pandemic in the last year. Today's topic in our Putting on Habits focus group prayer series is prayer. So here's a question. How has your pandemic prayer life been going? Not every day you're asked that. But it's an important question nevertheless. Think back if you can to this time last year. How was your pre-pandemic prayer life? Did you have a prayer habit back then? And if so, has it developed and deepened? Or perhaps it's weakened and you find yourself really struggling, particularly as we can't meet in person with each other to pray and worship together. The Lord's Prayer, although it can provide a framework for personal prayer, is a prayer we are used to praying as we meet together as the church family. Certainly, technology can allow some folks to meet online, but nobody would ever suggest that that is a satisfying substitute for meeting together in person. A problem, too, with technology is that you can very easily, particularly in lockdown, be constantly switched on to all sorts of Zoom meetings, team meetings, social media, etc., which can sometimes become draining and life-sapping. And any notion of be still and know that I am God goes completely out the window. And our Father doesn't get much of a look in. In developing a personal prayer habit, each of us must decisively and deliberately carve out a space each day to pray. And depending on your particular circumstances, what time you choose and where will vary. I live in my own, so finding a space to pray isn't a problem which isn't the same as saying it always happens. In our focus group, as in every group, there are larks and owls and folks somewhere in between. As I get a wee bit older, I'm becoming more of a lark than the owl I once was. I was up bright and early at 10 sharp. I kind of laid back lark. The important point is not when you pray, where you pray, but that you do pray. The importance of prayer to Jesus isn't in doubt. All the gospel writers note Jesus praying, arguably look more so than the others. Some examples include that Jesus' baptism by John the Baptist. When all the people were being baptized, Jesus was baptized too. And as he was praying, Heaven was opened, and the Holy Spirit descended on him in bodily form like a dove. 
And a voice came from heaven, You are my son whom I love. With you I am well pleased. After Jesus healed a man with leprosy, we read, Yet the news about him spread all the more, so that crowds of people came to hear him, and he healed them of their illnesses. But Jesus often withdrew to lonely places and prayed. Jesus particularly prayed, perhaps with greater intensity, before making major decisions. One of those days, Jesus went out on a mountainside to pray and spent the night praying to God. When morning came, he called his disciples to him and chose 12 of them, whom he also designated apostles. And at key moments in Jesus' mission, Jesus went out as usual to the Mount of Olives, and his disciples followed him. Note that, note that. Jesus went out as usual to the Mount of Olives. This wasn't just an occasional thing, although the prayer session that comes next is particularly intense. On reaching that place, he said to them, pray that you will not fall into temptation. He withdrew about a stone's throw beyond them, knelt down and prayed, Father, if you are willing, take this cup from me, yet not what my will, but yours be done. An angel from heaven appeared to him and strengthened him. And being in anguish, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat was like drops of blood falling to the ground. Note that in prayer, Jesus is strengthened in prayer. When he rose from prayer and went back to disciples, he found them asleep, exhausted from sorrow. Note that, the disciples have had enough. They've gone for a cup. They can't take much more of all the stuff that's going on. And yet Jesus says to them, why are you sleeping? Get up and pray so that you will not fall in to temptation. I don't know about you, but if things aren't going particularly great for me, I'm inclined to kind of curl up into myself and try and shut everything out. But that's not what Jesus urges us to do. Prayer clearly isn't always a walk in the park. And as followers of Christ, we are in a spiritual battle, something which I readily confess I'm apt to forget and also can struggle to get my head round. Just before this prayer time in Gethsemane, Jesus assures Peter, Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to sift all of you, note that, all of you, as wheat. But I prayed for you, Simon, that your faith may not fail. And when you have turned back, strengthen your brothers. So Jesus is praying for the disciples. And he prays that they strengthen each other. And of course, in John 17, he prays for all the disciples, and indeed for you and I, for all his disciples that come after him. Philip Yancey, in his book, Prayer, Does It Make a Difference?, which I'm currently reading again, writes, After surveying Jesus' practice of prayer, I realize that his example does answer one important question about prayer. Does it matter? When doubts creep in, and I wonder whether prayer is a sanctified form of talking to myself, I remind myself that the Son of God who has spoken worlds into being and sustains all that exists felt a compelling need to pray. 
He prayed as if it made a difference, as if time devoted to prayer mattered every bit as much as the time he devoted to caring for people. A physician friend of mine who learned I was investigating prayer told me I would have to start with three rather large assumptions. One, God exists. Two, God is capable of hearing our prayers. And three, God cares about our prayers. None of these three can be proved or disproved, he said. They must either be believed or disbelieved. He's right, of course, although for me the example of Jesus offers strong evidence in favour of that belief. To discount prayer, to conclude that it doesn't matter, means to view Jesus as deluded. In keeping with his race, Jesus truly believed that prayer could change things. Romans of the time prayed to their gods as one would finger a good luck charm, not really expecting much. The sceptical Greeks derided prayer, their playwrights weaving foolish, ridiculous, even obscene prayers into their plays to provoke the audience to uproarious laughter. Only the stubborn Jews, despite their tragic history of unanswered prayers, contended that a supreme and loving God ruled the earth, listened to their prayers, and would someday respond. Jesus claimed to be part of that response, the fulfillment of the Jewish longing for Messiah. Anyone who has seen me has seen the Father, he once said and went about exhibiting the will of the Father by feeding the hungry, healing the sick, and liberating the captives. At the heart of today's passage in Luke 11 is the nature of God. Who is this God we should get into the habit of praying to? By using the word Father, Jesus is saying a whole lot more about the nature of God. In Galatians 4, 6, 7, Paul writes, Because you are his sons, God sent the Spirit of his Son into our hearts, the Spirit who calls out, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but God's child. And since you are his child, God also made you an heir. Again, in Romans 8, 15, the spirit you receive does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Rather, the spirit you received brought about your adoption to sonship. And by him we cry, Abba, Father. William Barclay notes, in Hebrew, the name means the whole character of the person as it is revealed and known to us. Psalm 9.10 says, those who know your name put their trust in you. This means far more than knowing that God's name is Yahweh. It means that those who know the whole character and mind and heart of God will gladly put their trust in him. I'm sure when you hear my name, you think, great guy, wonderful guy, a saint, a genius, and so modest. One of the standout praise psalms, Psalm 136, urges us, assures us, encourages us, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, his love endures forever. Give thanks to the God of gods, his love endures forever. Give thanks to the Lord of lords, his love endures forever. In all 26 verses, as various aspects of God's greatness and faithfulness through thick and thin, particularly at this point to Israel, we are assured his love endures forever. The parable in Luke 11 of the friend who goes to another friend and batters on his door is designed to emphasize both God's nature 
and the nature of our prayers. Now, the neighbor isn't shouting and bawling and battering on the door at midnight to tell his pal Tesco are doing a buy one, get one free offer on multi-pack bags of crisps. But from our perspective, making this kind of fuss for the sake of three loaves seems a bit over the top. The particular context and culture, however, tell a different story. It was a serious faux pas, social faux pas, to fail to provide hospitality to visitors no matter what time of day they turned up at your door. We can speculate that the visitors had either missed the express bus and had to get a 201, or were trying to avoid travelling in the heat of the day. House doors were left open all day, and fresh daily bread was made to supply the needs of the household for that day with perhaps a little left over. A shut door was a clear sign that the family had retired for the night. The householder's excuse that he couldn't get up because the door is already locked and getting up would disturb the rest of the household wouldn't wash. He would ultimately get up because of the persistent shouting and door knocking, i.e. shameless audacity, to avoid the inevitable later public scandal when word got round the village. Kenneth Bailey notes, a Middle Eastern audience would have laughed out loud at this lame excuse. Can you imagine such a neighbour, Jesus is saying? Certainly not. No one in my village would act so rudely. If he did, the entire village would know about it by morning. This is no trivial request. The host whose cupboards are bare needs to get supplies so that he can welcome and feed his tired, hungry visitors. His reputation is at stake too. There is an urgency. There's an urgent need to be met, and boy, he's going to ask and seek and knock for all he's worth until that need is satisfied. His neighbour will respond out of duty to save his reputation and respectability. A joyful giver, he is not. Now here we see the contrast between a crotchety, sleep-deprived neighbour and our Father God. God doesn't require our pester power to give us what we need. After all, in Christ we are his children. Yet here's the point. The needy neighbour recognised his need and knew what he had to do to have that need met so that in turn he could serve and feed his visitors. But very often we don't recognise either our need of God or the urgency of our neighbour's need of God. We ask, seek, knock, often with little real enthusiasm or conviction or expectation, and too often asking, seeking, going after the wrong things things that don't ultimately satisfy and are left ultimately disappointed. Leon Morris notes, we mustn't play at prayer, but must show persistence if we don't receive the answer immediately. It's not that God is unwilling and must be pressed into answering. The whole context makes it clear he is eager to give. But if we do not want what we are asking for enough to be persistent, we do not want it very much. It is not such tepid prayer that is answered. Jesus has told us, this is how much God loved the world. He gave his son, his one and only son, and this is why 
so that no one need be destroyed. By believing in him, anyone can have a whole and lasting life. And I came so you can have real and eternal life, more and better life than you ever dreamed of. Tom Wright comments, what counts is persistence. There are all sorts of ways in which God isn't like a sleepy friend, but Jesus is focusing on one point of comparison only. He is encouraging a kind of holy boldness, a sharp knocking on the door, an insistent asking, a search that refuses to give up. That's what our prayers should be like. This isn't just a routine or formal praying. Going through the motions is a daily or weekly task. There is a battle on, a fight with powers of darkness, and those who have glimpsed the light are called to struggle in prayer for peace, for reconciliation, for wisdom, for a thousand things for the world and the church, perhaps a hundred or two, for one's family, friends, and neighbors, and perhaps a dozen or two for yourself. There are, of course, too many things to pray about. That's why it's important to be disciplined and regular. If you leave it to the whim of the moment, you'll never be a true intercessor, somebody through whose prayers God's love is poured out into the world. But because these things are urgent, important and complex, there has to be more to prayer than simply discipline and regularity. Formal prayers, including official liturgies for church services, are vital for most people for their spiritual health. But they are like the metal shell of a car. To be effective, it needs fuel for its engine. And to be effective, Prayers need energy too. In this case, the kind of dogged and even funny determination that you'd use with a sleepy friend who you hope would help you out of a tight spot. Philip Yancey references a strange incident where Jacob, who had cheated his brother Esau out of his birthright and was consequently on the run, wrestled all night with God in prayer. Jacob the cheat walked cockily on two good legs. Israel limped into history as the father of nations. The real value of persistent prayer is not so much that we get what we want as that we become the person we should. Asking Seeking, knocking, does have an effect on God, as Jesus insists, but it also has a lasting effect on the asker, seeker, knocker. Back in January, when Gordon sent out the topic for today, and I read Luke 11, 1 to 13, and before reading any commentaries or anything else, The last verse, verse 13, jumped out at me. If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? Jesus is emphatic. This is a promise. This is a fact. As children of God, we receive the Holy Spirit. As we ask, seek, knock, as we show willing to receive God's good gifts, so we are changed. More and more we become like Jesus, and more and more heaven becomes reality on earth as we partner with God as he builds his kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. Paul assures us, for those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. The Spirit you receive does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. 
Rather, the spirit you received brought about your adoption to sonship. And by him we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit. We are God's children. Now, if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. If indeed we share in his sufferings, in order that we may also share in his glory. Let's pray. Father God, you have given us your spirit. You have adopted us into your family. We have the great privilege of being your children, loved beyond measure. Your Son, our Saviour, died for each one of us. Thank you, Father. And yet how slow we are to come in thanks. How slow we are to recognize our need. Pray, God, that you would pour out our spirit and that we would be open to the leading of your spirit and that we would go in the strength of that spirit to proclaim in all areas of our life and work and who we come into contact with that your name would be known and more and more people would ask and receive your Holy Spirit and come into your family. This we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. In a moment, we will share our faith with the Apostles' Creed, and Maureen will lead us in our prayers of intercession. For now we sing, O breath of life, come sweeping through us. I believe in God the Father Almighty, the Creator of heaven and earth. And I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under the Pontius Pilate, was crucified, and died in his grave. He descended into the dead. And on the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seen. 
morning. Let's pray together. Father God, we thank you for the privilege of coming to you with our prayers. We thank you for the many blessings you have given us and think for a moment of the good gifts you have placed in our lives. At this time of Lent, we reflect on Jesus' life, death, resurrection and thank you for sending the gift of your Son to save us. Loving Father, on this day set aside to celebrate mothers, we pray that mums and carers will feel really special and valued today and know how much they are loved. We pray for those who may find today difficult. May they know your peaceful presence as their heavenly parent. We pray for all mothers and bring to you those who struggle to provide for their families, homes where there is little or no food, where conflict and danger is the norm, and where they are unable to offer a safe home. Over the past year, we have been urging people to be safe and stay safe, but for many, being safe is something they know little about. May your compassion be brought to them through the agencies offering help and support. Christian Aid is celebrating 75 years of outreach to the most vulnerable and marginalised and are at this time working in around 30 countries worldwide, providing aid and responding to emergencies and working with communities to restore and improve their lives and give hope for the future. We pray for strength, courage and resilience for the workers. Almighty God, the world you left in our care is broken. Help us, Lord, to continue to pray for these situations, to give financially what we can, and believe, Lord, that trusting in you can make a difference and that you are in control. We pray for all who lead us, and when they have to make huge and difficult decisions, they will do so with integrity. We pray that leaders will continue to send aid to struggling countries and that vaccines will be made available to all and not just the rich. Give our leaders wisdom, Lord. Caring God, we are hugely grateful that the numbers of people affected by the pandemic here appear to be falling. We are so appreciative of the vaccine and the efficient way it has been rolled out. Lord, bless all who have made this possible. We pray for caution as we are gently going to ease back into a less restrictive way of life and pray for hope for a brighter future moving forward as we reflect on what is truly important to us. We pray for better systems and earlier support for those battling with addiction, for those found homeless and for people with poor mental health. As our children and young people return to education, we pray, Lord, for those for whom being isolated from social situations and their support networks has caused them real anxieties. Let them feel you near, Lord. We pray that anxieties will quickly ease and not make a lasting effect. We bring to you our prayers for those who work and volunteer for the charities like Sam H., Childline, NSPCC. Keep them strong, Lord. We pray for our worldwide church, and as we worship today from the safety and comfort of our homes, we think of Christians who are putting their lives in danger to meet and learn about you. Protect them and keep them safe, Lord. We pray for our hard-working and committed ministry team here, and prayerfully show our appreciation that over the last difficult year, we have been able to worship, learn and discuss together. Thanks to all who have made this possible. Caring God, we bring our prayers now for all who are having a difficult time and ask you to come into their situations with your love and peace. 
We take a moment now to name them. Faithful God, we trust only in you, knowing that you are with us during life's hardships, disappointments and joys. Strengthen us, Lord, this week, no matter what we face, and help us to confidently show your love to others in all we say and do. We say these prayers in Jesus' name. Amen.